author's representative. So authors hire us. Uh, we are paid on commission from clients. We're not paid by the publishers. And we kind of manage the entire business for authors. It lets them kind of do all of the craft stuff that they need to do to be successful. And we manage all the business. So we do everything from pitching clients' works to publishers to negotiating the deals, negotiating the contracts, and kind of work as a project manager. Obviously, depends on the client, depends on the publisher, but really kind of seeing things through from beginning to end. We do everything in the early stages from kind of editing clients' works, you know, discovering them, um, finding them in what we call um, the slush pile, which we can define all of our terminology, but basically authors and writers pitch us their books. Um, and the slush pile is kind of where the physical manuscripts arrive. Um, I worked in publishing at the, I started working in publishing at the tail end of physically mailing in manuscripts. So my first job in publishing was to physically receive them from the mailman, sort them all by agent. And then when we were going to reject things, I had to kind of get everything organized and people had to mail them in with self-addressed stamped envelopes and take everything back to the post office to mail things back for rejection. So that was my first job in publishing. We are all digital now. This is obviously all done. I was going to say, I was going to say, you were actually receiving physical manuscripts and mailing. I mean, that was, that's old school. I know. Well, it was in London in the UK at a very old school agency, and they were one of the last ones. So this is 2009. They were one of the last holdouts for physical mail. And you can imagine it was in a townhouse in London, and we were like, the walls were crawling with manuscripts. It was just like everything always felt like it was going to come in down on us, and piles and piles of work. So yeah, I, I remember the, the physicality of, of all these manuscripts. Do you miss that? Yes and no. I, I said this before on social media, but I... I honestly felt like when the mailman would arrive with this like Santa bag of mail of manuscripts, like it felt like Christmas day. I mean, it was like authors like, you know, mailing us their, their work. And it was so special to me and exciting, especially being a new person in publishing, um, just like never knowing what you're going to get in the mail that day. Um, and so that feeling has never really left me. I, I do think it's very exciting. Obviously it's all done by email, but I don't miss like being the assistant that had to truck back and forth to uh, the post office every day. <laughs> right. Right. So let's talk about how writers pitch agents, like best practices. What are the fundamentals? Mm -hmm. So basically the most straightforward way is to email us. And so what we call that email, it's basically in any other industry, it'd be like a cover letter, but we call it a query letter. And our pitch letter is what you, how you pitch agents. So a lot of this, as I said, is done by email. There are conferences or kind of internet pitch contests, but really the best way is to reach us in our inboxes where we spend all of our time. And so the query letter, the query letters that I like to receive have a very simple formula. And really you can just follow a three paragraph formula and it kind of goes like this. So the best way to remember it is hook, book, cook. That's kind of the easiest way to remember. But so your hook is your kind of, you know, your stakes, your conflicts, you know, what is exciting about this actual project. Um, and in this first paragraph, you should also include your comp titles, meaning comparative titles. So, you know, what books are yours in conversation with? And what books should yours kind of sit on the shelf with? And in your future bookstore, your genre, your word count, all of that should kind of be in that hook paragraph. And I have some samples for you guys, too. Can I stop you? Can I stop you real quick? I just want to, I have a question about comp titles <laughs> because I think sometimes writers struggle with this. They go, oh, well, wait a minute. I'm not, like, I don't know if there's an exact perfect corollary. Does there need to be one? Yeah, that's such a great question. And I feel like I answer comp questions more frequently than any other questions because writers get really hung up on it, right? Because they're thinking, is it a good thing that I don't have any direct comps? Is that a bad thing? You know, what does that say about me and my work or how I kind of imagine my work? So that's why I always say like books that yours are in conversation with, because it doesn't need to be, you know, this plot is the same, right? So that's a comp or, you know, I feel like my writing is like so-and-so, therefore it's a comp. It can be a, a total mashup of things. I don't mind, um, you know, film and TV comps, podcast comps, right? Like documentary comps. Like I think we we should think about it in the sense of you know a multimedia experience because a lot of books go on to you know vip in other spaces so i'm very open to comps in absolutely any space um the one thing i will say is you know when writers will say there's nothing else out there like me you know that's a bit of a red flag so i'm like okay is that because um 
maybe it's like in a category that's a bit more experimental and like you know there isn't and and that means it will be very hard to place or sell to a publisher or know where it belongs in a bookstore or that maybe tells me like maybe you're not reading enough in your category or um you're not opening your eye your your mind to whether it could be you know similar in voice or similar in style or again similar in category or you know the way that you imagine your career to go so there's a lot of different kind of angles and approaches i think it's best to, to pick something pretty contemporary um, it's okay to kind of go back and into the archives a little bit. Um, you know, if, if you're going to have two or three comps, really, you know, two is kind of enough. But if you're going to have one comp that's really, you know, old school, make sure you have a modern comp. Or if you're going to have a film TV comp, also have a book comp. So you're kind of like painting this picture for us of, of how you kind of imagine your book to be kind of in the world. Okay. And so writers out there who are needing an agent would have as I think maybe primary option, writing a query letter, emailing an agent directly, pitching the work. Um, and we're gonna get to that in more detail in a second, but there's also, like you said, the, the you use the term slush pile. I think most of us know what that is, but it's worth defining. And then there are other ways that it happens. Sometimes it's like a referral. I hear that maybe more often than I hear anything is you'll know a writer who has an agent and that friend will introduce you. And then there are also conferences. There are contests occasionally. Am I missing anything or is that the, the main stuff? That's really, that's really the main, the main reasons. And the reason I like to focus on the query letters and the slush pile is that that's really where agents sign the majority of their clients. I mean, cause we can meet somebody at a conference or get a referral, but really we have to see the work, right? We have to see the writing in front of us to know if it's going to be a fit for us. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's it. It's like, you can get along with somebody. I think sometimes writers might feel like, well, we got along so well, or we're, you know, I'm charming. <laughs> there was report, but it has to be, the work has to be something that the agent feels that he or she can sell. Yeah. And I think there's this Hollywood version of like what an agent is. And they're like, in order to get in the door, you have to know somebody. And those referrals do, you know, do count for something. But agents rep things that we that we really love, you know, and I, there's a lot of wonderful people out there. And I've rejected a lot of their books. And, you know, I, I still think they're wonderful people. But, you know, I have to put my name out there every time I'm pitching something. I put my career on the line, you know, every time I'm pitching something. So we kind of create um, this relationship, professional relationship together. And I want to just stand up for things that I'm just the most excited about and you know i only have so many hours in the day too yeah yeah no i think like people sometimes ask me writers will sometimes ask me not that i'm any expert but you know just i've been at this for a while and they'll say well what you know how do i get an agent what should i look for and the best advice i ever got and i've been passing it along ever since is follow the enthusiasm like you have to want you have to sign with you, you want to sign with an agent who is truly enthusiastic about you and your work and I think that's preferable to maybe signing with an agent who's like a name agent or a big, you know, a quote unquote big agent. If that big agent isn't truly deeply enthused about you, it probably won't work out. Right. Absolutely. Oh yeah. I say that all the time. I call it the chain of enthusiasm because, you know, it starts with the author, right? They write this enthusiastic query letter, right? And they're trying to get this enthusiastic agent and the agent has to then sell it to a very enthusiastic editor, right? You don't just want any editor, any publishing house. You want the one that's most passionate about it. And all of those marketing material, all of, all of that turns into marketing materials, right? Which then turns into the sales forces kind of tip sheets that they sell into the bookstores. And then, you know, so this, this energy that you're talking about, it's really palatable and that's something that really does start start with the author and as I said can really carry through that's what gets everybody excited as, as we go along um, and that's kind of what makes everybody enjoy working in publishing is, is that chain of excitement okay so let's say that I'm a writer and I am at a writer's conference and Carly Waters is there and I'm walking up to you what are some do's and don'ts <laughs> in terms of like how to approach? I mean, writers are tend to be kind people, I think, in general and tend to be awkward. So let's just assume it's going to be slightly awkward. But what are some ways to maybe help your cause or hurt yeah. your cause? Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think that's such a good question. I mean, number one, 
if you were a writer, you would have, again, researched everybody going to the conference and presumably thought, hey, Carly Waters is a fit for me. Therefore, I know maybe a little bit about her list or I've read a client's book or listened to her podcast or heard around other people. Right. So um, there should be some kind of understanding um, going into it. So if you know a little bit about me, and you know, kind of what I'm interested in and you think that we'd be a fit. That's a really great start. You know, I think a lot of writers think that these query letters or, you know, being in the top you know, percentile of, you know, authors that end up getting an agent has to be special in some way but it's really just like following the rules queering people that are aligned with your your taste and so if you were again to find me at the conference you know you might find me during the pitch sessions or you might find me um you know after a panel you might find me at the happy hour bar at four o'clock you know wherever you find me you know come up to me um and really i do want to hear about your book i want to hear your elevator pitch and so knowing how to describe your book in that sense is so important I think a lot of writers want to talk about you know themes or how a book is going to make somebody feel or you know they want to kind of really get into detail about the synopsis of the book but really what I want to know is is the hook right the, what's the character you know what's their journey but more like what's the stakes for this journey what conflicts is this character getting into um that really kind of more plotty business of the actual book itself because the themes I'm going to infer that once I've actually read your book right you don't need to pitch me themes what you need to do is pitch me a book right pitch me a concept um something that I can really understand easily and, and get excited about. So, you know, and if we do have a set number, you know, of minutes together, for example, if it is a pitch session or, you know, you want to catch me before I'm running off to another event, um, being as quick as possible is best, but also leaving room for questions, right? Because I think one thing writers think they have to do is like, oh, say I get, I know Carly has to finish this panel and be somewhere else. So I know she has only a set amount of time. So I'm going to talk her ear off for those like seven minutes or whatever, right? It's like, don't talk my ear for the seven minutes. Talk my ear off for three minutes, four minutes, right? Then save those other minutes for questions, interaction. Um, you know, you want to ask my opinion about the latest industry scandal or, you know, the latest merger or acquisition, right? Like that's the rapport building. I think that can be really important, but obviously the most important thing is, is pitching me your, your really great book. Okay. So a couple things that I'm hearing, first of all, is doing your homework. If you're going to be querying an agent via email or approaching an agent in person at a conference or uh, something along those lines, it's a great idea to know who that agent is, who she represents, the kinds of writers that she represents, the kind of work that she's interested uh, in, whether or not she's even accepting new clients at all. Sometimes agents don't, you know, they've got their, they've got their fill. So there's that aspect of it. And in terms of knowing, I guess there's agency websites. Sometimes those can be pretty minimalist in terms of what they divulge. You seem like a pretty online agent, like an unusually online agent, which I think might be generational. So people, I think, could get a sense of you because you're out there and you're talking about this stuff on your podcast and, and social media and so on. But one thing that I've advised in the past is just to look at the acknowledgments sections of books by writers you admire. They always thank their agent. That's a good way to get a sense of the like DNA, uh, the creative DNA that an agent is interested in. And so that's one part of it. Do your homework. Is there anything you would add to that? Like, have, have I covered it? Yeah, I think those, I think, you know, acknowledgement sections are so full of gold. You know, there's so much information in there in terms of everybody they're thanking. That's a, the acknowledgements definitely is somewhere that I would say 99.9% 9, of authors always remember to thank their agents in there. Um, And then there is, there is kind of a very magical website called Publishers Marketplace where agents do kind of log their deals and publishers log their deals. It does there is a subscription involved. I think it's around $25 a month. But what I have advised people to do in the past is they have a couple year, a couple times a year, they have promotional um, times. I think it's usually around Thanksgiving or the December holidays. They kind of sneak it in there where you get at a discounted rate or you just pay the $25 for one month, do all of your research. And for $25, there's a lot of information in there. It's, you know, agent's entire history of, of deals and publisher and editor's entire history of deals. You spend that one month and then you just cancel after that. So that's a really good way to spend $25. I think um, Writer's Digest also has a kind of a phone book of agents. They call it the, the Guide to Agents. They've done 30 editions over the years. It's, it's yearly. They update it. Um, that's a really good spot. Manuscriptwishlist.com also logs all of agents' interests 
Um, and, you know, there's there's also the professional associations that I mentioned, AALA um, and PACLA, and also in the UK as well, there's an agents association. So lots of information on the internet, that's for sure. Okay. And so the second thing that I was hearing as you were talking a bit ago, in addition to do your homework, is to have done the the work of understanding your book to the level that you can pitch it verbally in a sentence or two, the elevator pitch. And this is kind of an entertainment industry thing, but I think it's a useful practice for writers as well, writers of literature as well, because it's not so much that you're trying to like oversimplify your work or dumb it down. It's actually really hard, I think, to do the thought work involved to be able to deliver a compelling pitch quickly. It's a great way to really evaluate your own work and make sure that you're telling a clear, compelling story. If you can't do an elevator pitch, it might be a sign that you have more work to do. Yeah, that's actually the number one sign to me when I am getting a manuscript ready to pitch to editors, because I also have to pitch editors. So pitching is part of my job, and I understand. So I love empathy with creative letter writing. And so that's the number one clue to me if, if a book isn't ready to go on submission, is if I can't do my elevator pitch quickly. Or I'm like, I'm struggling with, you know, this hook, or trying to figure out what the stakes are here, or like just trying to figure out why editors will care. So it's incredibly important. Um, on last week, I was in New York for um, my client Andrew Dunlop's launch um, and Zibby, it was with Zibby Books. And so Zibby was moderating. And before the before the panel started, Zibby said, I want to I wanna thank all the authors that showed up here. And I'm going to have all the authors stand up and introduce themselves and give us a little bit about your book. And so it was such a good reminder to all of these authors and obviously all of us attending to think like when you have your one moment, when Zibby Books, you know, when Zibby Owens from Zibby Books says, stand up and tell us, tell this audience of 200 people about your book that you have to kind of be ready to go. Right. And so it was really wonderful. And there was 20 authors in the audience and they all went around, told us who they were and did their elevator pitch. Right. Like that's that's kind of your moment. And that's obviously a, a microcosm, but you never know when your, your Zibby Owens moment is going to come. Yeah. So, and that could be in person, but it could also be, and will more likely be in a written query letter. It's equally important to get it right in either context. And you said a bit ago that there's a formula for a query letter and it's, you use the words hook, book, and cook. So let's just, let's go over this again. So people get it. The first thing is hook. And is this elevator pitch? This is the elevator pitch. Yeah, the whole paragraph, I call it the hook paragraph, but it really should be the elevator pitch, but also to include the comp titles and the word count and the genre. And I think we went off on our on our comp title conversation. But if we want some kind of samples, I'm happy to give the listeners um, some samples. So I have two client samples, and then I also have a fun um, just kind of generalist sample so everybody can kind of get a sense of, of what kind of this means. It's very similar to like a log line if you know if you're working the entertainment business, but really we're thinking about how can we summarize something in one sentence. So first of all, here's a generalist example for you. So with his brothers already devoured by a serial killer known only as the big bad wolf, the third pig fights for his life with just a pile of bricks between him and a certain death. So that's three little pigs told in a log line salesy pitchy way. Um, and I have a client sample. Um, so this is from my client, Lindsay Wong, uh, and she wrote a memoir. And this is the way that she pitched her book to me. The Woo Woo is a memoir about surviving a fantastically crazy Chinese family that thinks mental illness is fucking bullshit. So again, how are we summarizing that? That's That was her. That was her way of, of pitching me all of the kind of most important things of the book. And now I have a, a novel example for you from my client, um, Glendy Vandera. This is from this is her pitch to me for Where the Forest Meets the Stars. And she said, A cancer survivor and her reclusive neighbor are caught up in the escapist fantasies of an endangered child. So it's really just how do we figure out how to sum this up in one sentence? And I know it's so hard because you spend, you know, writers spend years working on these projects and 80,000 words working on this project. And they're like, why do I have to drill it down into a single sentence? But it's right. because you have to be able to pitch it. And, uh, and the reality also is that not everybody is going to read everything, right? Like everything that comes into my inbox, I, you know, in terms of slush pile, I don't read it all. And so, because I can't, I'm just, you know, I'm one person. And so when you can write a really good pitch, it encourages me to like, yeah, I really want to read to the end to figure out like what happens to this book. Yeah. 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 Okay. So the next uh, word that you used in your like little trilogy <laughs> is book. So there's hook and then there's book. 
So our book paragraph is really our summary paragraph. I think some authors get this confused with a synopsis paragraph, meaning, you know, it's it's the nuts and bolts. It This is a nuts and bolts paragraph. However, it should read a lot more like back cover copy than straight synopsis, because this whole this whole email is a selling tool, right? This whole, you know, hook, book, cook, this is all a selling tool. And so our book paragraph, it shouldn't be, um, you know, too focused on naming all the characters or too focused on, again, the, the very minutia of nuts and bolts because that could make this pitch really long we really want this book paragraph to be you know short concise and really focused on the most exciting things about the book again what's at stake for this character um and why it matters you know why it matters that we follow this character and get invested in them okay this feels like an affirmation to me because i have often you know again with my limited (laughs) expertise but people ask me and i'm like keep your query letter short on the shorter side like one screen length is usually going to be, I mean, I'm just thinking of this as a human being, not as a professional even, because I am constantly getting pitched guests for this show. And the pitch letters that I get from publicists are consistently like these 3,500 word long block paragraph pitch letters. And it's overwhelming to me. I'm like, I wish somebody would just be like, hi, Brad. <laughs> like, instead, it, it feels like a form letter, A, and then B, it's just too much to digest. I wish that it would be more of like a quick, you know, s- distillation and a more human exchange. So does that register with you? I mean, is that more or less what you're saying? Like, try Yeah, to- I love, yeah, I love what you said about keeping it on one kind of email page, right? Like, imagine I am on my laptop and I can only see so much on that one screen, right? As soon as I have to scroll, you might have lost me. So you do want to kind of make it sure it's all visually there. Um, all, all of that is is incredibly important. And I think when sometimes authors think that, okay, great, I get her to open the email, right? And so I've got her to open the email, so she's going to read the whole email. But they also think that's their one moment, right, to hook me. Um, And so they need to tell me everything about them. They need to tell me their whole writing history, and they need to tell me why this book matters, and they got to tell me all the themes. But if you do the job of the pitch right, we will have those future conversations, and we will get there, right? But really, you have to follow the the protocol, right? And and it is a, it is a one paragraph, um, you know, body paragraph, that one book paragraph that has to do all the work. Okay. And uh, just to, I think you made a great distinction earlier where you say, or where you said, this is not a a full synopsis of the book. It should read more like back cover copy or, you know, flap copy. That's, that's it. I think so many times people, like you said, they think it's their one shot at glory and they literally synopsize their entire novel for you. I have argued in the past that it's pretty impossible to synopsize even a great story, movie, novel, memoir, whatever it is. To fully synopsize anything like that well is almost impossible. Everything sounds terrible in a full synopsis. <laughs> but but flap copy, you can make a, you can make it compelling and interesting. You almost want it to be a little bit mysterious. It's not about spelling it all out. Let the agent or the reader read the whole thing for that experience, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, especially with thrillers, right? Because I think a lot of authors get a bit tripped up because they're like, I'm pitching this book. Does the agent need to know, you know, what happens in the end or who's the killer, that sort of thing. Um, but the, your future synopsis that you write will cover all of that. I in, in the actual pitch email, you don't have to tell me, you know, who the baddie was in the end. It's really just about getting me to request the pages. That's the entire job of the query letters. How do I get this agent to request and read more? That's it. Okay, so for people listening... Let's underline that the the job of the query letter, the whole mission of sending a query letter is not to get the agent to offer to sign you. It's to get them to request your manuscript so they can read. Exactly. And the same, you know, in-person conferences, right? I'm not going to meet you for seven minutes and not read your book and offer representation. The point of our meeting in person is to lay all that groundwork for future sending of the book and then wanting to work on it. Okay. So the book, we did hook and then we just did book and now we're getting to cook. What is, what do you mean by cook? So really it's just a simple way to say the author, right? They are the person that cooked up the project, but really it's just how we rhyme with, with hook and book. So that is (laughs) you, the author, you are the cook of the project and I just want your author bio. You know, I think there are a lot of authors who want to include 
a lot of information in there. Again, I don't need your life story. Don't need your whole resume. Um, I would really just want to focus on a few things, which is where you live is generally important just as a point of information. So if you don't want to tell me like your suburb or whatever, that's totally fine. You could say, you know, your general area, you know, again, the state you live in, something like that. Any of that is fine. It just gives me a little bit of framing and understanding and context. All of that is helpful. Some people feel like it's important to tell me their job and I am completely open to that. Um, sometimes it's, it's best to use that type of information if it is particularly relevant to the book itself. For example, if you are writing about a... Um, Actually, can I stop you yeah. real quick? I'm yeah. so sorry. I just because I, I know people at home might be going, if I live in New York, does it give me an advantage? If I live in South <laughs> Dakota, does it, dis does it somehow disadvantage me? That's an interesting question. And I would say absolutely not. Um, I, I think you should just tell me that information because, again, it just frames my understanding a little bit about you and how you're kind of coming to things, but there's absolutely no advantage or disadvantage to being anywhere in the world other than a point of information. Okay, great, great, great. So no. please continue. I know, like, I don't know what you said. It was like, you want to know where they're from and then... Oh, we we're talking about career. Yeah. So if you want to include your job, completely up to you. Um, if you are a, for example, you're an engineer and your character is, you know, the protagonist is an engineer, that is useful information to me because it tells me like, hey, they kind of, they know what they're talking about. They're, um, and I do personally believe that anybody can write about anything in the world, but sometimes that little specialized knowledge can be quite interesting. I'd love to know if you're a librarian or a bookseller, or if you are kind of in a writing adjacent or publishing adjacent field, I think that can be interesting information. Um, I don't want to hear that you've been writing poetry since you were eight. That's not valuable information to me. Um, I would stick to, um, you know, alma maters, um, you know, career um, and location. And, and that's kind of it. If you do, if you are somebody that happens to have been published in literary journals or you're a journalist and have a lot of bylines, you know, you can obviously include links to your website or, or any kind of links to any articles that you think could be particularly important. Um, there are, there will be writers who are thinking, I don't have anything to put in my author bio. What if I don't have any of those things? I honestly love it when authors just write, this is my debut novel. I love it because publishing loves debuts because, you know, it is the launch pad for something, the beginning of a wonderful career. Very exciting. No track record. It's like a blank slate, um, you know, the beginning of, of the, the rocket ship ride. So I think that's great. So there's no harm or shame of just saying like, this is my debut novel. And, you know, if you've never published before, th those simple lines can work wonders. The other thing is that if you are in my inbox in the slush pile, I kind of assume this is your first novel. And so, you know, it, it, you don't have to worry or be stressed if you don't have any bylines or anything like that. So something I have found is that sometimes I'll be a writer who, or often there's writers who are looking for representation, who have had some publishing success, especially in the digital era, you know, where they're either publishing in online journals or print journals, or they've studied in an MFA program with writers of note. They've won some kind of award. When I have advised writers about querying agents, something I've often had to kind of nudge them to do is what I, you know, I, I call it like name dropping. I'm just like, don't be afraid to like drop your professional credentials, whatever you have, if it's of significance and, you know, it's relevant to the situation. I think writers can sometimes be too modest in that way. And I feel like it's not about aggrandizing oneself. It's about letting the agent know that you have some street cred, right? I mean, that, that matters at least a little bit. Yeah, I talk a lot on social media about our concept of literary community and, and how we how we engage in literary community and whether that's online or through journalism or through an MFA program or whatever it is, um, kind of showing that you are part of a literary community can mean a lot. And so, again, community can mean so many different things, but... I really appreciate when I know somebody is invested in literary community because it means that they are part of a group of people that are going to show up for them kind of when it comes time or they have, you know, people that can potentially blurb them or, you know, something kind of under them in terms of, um, yeah, just kind of some some powers and muscle, even if it's not any sort of credentials, it could just be community and, and that counts for a lot. Okay. So uh, let's see, where are we? We did hook, book and cook. And then now it is where to find agents. And I think you touched on this a little bit earlier, but if somebody's like a total newbie and they're like, well, wait, where are the literary agents? Because there could be literary agents working out of a brownstone in London. There could be literary agents working in a high rise in New York City. 
There could be literary agents working out of their home office. How do you find them? Is it Publishers Marketplace again or... I, I honestly think, again, that's a good bang for your buck if you're going to kind of do some some investment there. The Writer's Digest Yearly Guide to Agents that I mentioned, um, pretty much all libraries carry those. You can just like get those out of the library. Um, poetsandwriters.org has a great resource and list of, of agents there. We talked about the acknowledgments of your favorite books manuscriptwishlist.com. Um, if you are on Twitter, you can just um, search, you know, in the search function on Twitter, the hashtag symbol MSWL, which is short form for manuscript wishlist. And a lot of agents and editors will just put whatever they're kind of looking for, interested in, and that as well. Um, yeah, the, the internet is a wonderful and scary place, though, too, because you're like, hey, this is where I can find all this information. How do you know if somebody might have a red flag attached to their name or something like that. And if you are concerned about somebody, um, you can go to absoluteright.com. Victoria Strauss, she runs a wonderful website to kind of let people know um, the bad apples out there. Absolute right, like W-R-I-T-E? Correct. Okay. So are there any like major don'ts? Like what are some things that cause you to immediately like delete an email <laughs> or just... You know what I'm saying? Have you is there are there common threads or the things you see you've seen over and over again that just don't work or that are just bad practices that people should try to avoid? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's the bad practices kind of in the query letters, and obviously, you know, because when I read the first five pages, you know, I'm obviously I'm, I'm looking at that as well. Um, you know, I I have a funny relationship with with spelling errors and grammatical errors. Cause on one hand I'm like, okay, just spell my name. Right. Like how hard is that just to get it right? right. You know, it's everywhere on the internet, please spell it. Right. Um, and then on the other hand, I'm like, I feel for writers out there, you know, they're, they're just trying to get an agent and maybe they make a spelling mistake here and there. So I try to be kind of open-minded about that. I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to be too hard on people if there's a spelling mistake here and there, I will get authors who pitch me, and then they follow up with an email right away being like, I'm so sorry I did this wrong or I, I didn't do this right or I didn't format that correctly. I'm, I don't think there's a need to kind of, you know, double down on or draw attention to the fact um, that maybe you didn't you didn't do something correctly the first time. You know, people are going to make errors. We're humans. I get it. Um, but, you know, there are guidelines for a reason and, and agents want to use these guidelines for a reason that they're there's a reason these these guidelines work and, and that we need them. So following the guidelines is really just the easiest thing. Um, I think, you know, I've kind of weaved some of my do's and don'ts in through the conversation so far, you know, really long query letters, you know, we don't need those. I don't need your life story. Um, those, those types of things are obviously important to me. What, what about, what about um, if you're querying an agent for the first time and you attach the first two chapters of your book, is that okay? Or do you think like, oh, that's presumptuous. You shouldn't be attaching pages until the pages have been requested. So that's, that's the thing that I have the most empathy for because every agency has their own guidelines and what they ask for. So one agency might say, paste in the first five pages. What is we, what, that's what we do at our agency. And then another agency might say, don't send it, don't attach us anything. So it's really just about, you know, going line by line for whatever that agency in particular is is looking for um so for our agency it's you know just paste in the email the query letter the pitch letter and then you paste in the first five pages so that we can just kind of like read on to see if we're interested in and then we send requests after that oh that's yeah so you don't have to open an attachment yeah okay I, I, i've always advised you just go ahead and send like the first few pages so it can't hurt anything and then if they're great then the person has an opportunity to actually like evaluate the work itself yeah, it's so funny because, as I said, I feel like I am very understanding of authors and what they're going through. There are some agents out there that are probably pretty cutthroat. It's like if you don't follow the the rules, you know, because everybody these days has all these, you know, Gmail filters, right? So if somebody doesn't follow the Gmail filter, they could be sent out to spam or sent into the trash inbox, right, by not following all the rules. So the Internet is, is the Wild West. Okay. So... Let's say you are a novelist or you have written a dreaded collection of short stories, <laughs> which agents are always like, write a novel. You know, that's, that's, the, that's what I've heard over and over again. But let's say you're a fiction writer and you um, are in need of representation. What are agents in general looking for in fiction clients? Oh, man. Yes, this is the great question as well. So I, I feel like obviously agents have tastes, you know, that, that differ across the board. Um, I think that the pandemic has, you know, 
definitely definitely had an impact on people's reading habits um, in a variety of ways. I think really long novels right now are really hard because people, you know, just generally don't have a lot of time. Nobody's ever had that much time. Um, but people are, are kind of liking novels that don't go over 100,000 words that we're keeping shorter. You know, obviously, we don't have to get too far into the weeds, but um, everybody kind of knows what's going on with the economy and operational costs going up and inflation. And so books get very expensive, the bigger they get. That's, right? that's a great point. That's a great point. It's that it's not that the book isn't great at 180,000 words. Maybe it is. But a lot of times writers don't realize there are production costs involved. It's more expensive to produce a 180,000 word novel. It's more pages. Yeah. And in translation, do you think that the Germans are going to buy that to translate? Absolutely not. Because then it's going to be right. you know, twice as big. So you know, there's these little things to think about, obviously. Um, so I think shorter novels are, we're going to see a lot more kind of tighter, shorter novels. What's a sweet spot? Like you said, n not more than 100,000 words. 100,000 words feels like a pretty long manuscript to me. I like 80. 80 feels good to me. Yeah, I'm going to be shopping around what I think is a shorter novel that's around 70. I would never rep an adult novel shorter than 70, though. Really? Yeah. The Great, yeah. Gatsby, I... the Great Gatsby was 47,000 <laughs> words. You wouldn't rep <laughs> you that? You think that would be published today? <laughs> yeah, I mean, who knows, right? I mean, who knows? But I feel like uh, like Slaughterhouse-Five was like 50. Mm -hmm. There are always these. Because I this is something I've obsessed over. I love short yeah. But then it like then there becomes this gray area like is it a novella or is it a novel and how long does a novel have to be and you know these categories can be blurry. They absolutely they absolutely can. But I think we're going to be in an era of shorter, tighter, you know, explain to us what's going on, have a lot of plot but like let's do it in 80,000 words or less. Um if you're if it's historical, if there's will, word building, you know, science fiction, fantasy, obviously there's a reason for the word, word count to get up higher. Um but I just don't work on a lot, a lot of science fiction fantasy. So. so something that I know agents look for, I mean every agent I think is is hoping to to land clients who have creative longevity, who are really full of books and who work and who are industrious and who are producers, right? Like that's what you want. You want somebody who's work you love and who does the work and consistently generates books to sell. Mm -hmm. That That's the goal. I mean, I think there's so much life that happens, but really, I mean, if you're, if you're going to be a novelist, if you're going to call yourself a writer, then you, you got to write books, you know? And as agents, we obviously work with a number of authors, but we get paid on commission from the projects that we work on. And so we want to kind of be in this realm of, you know, we, we know what's kind of coming next and, you know, we can sell that book to the publisher and then they have their option. Or, you know, obviously there's lots of mid-career moves that people make, you know, that lead to many long careers, but um, we want to work with authors that write. So that's obviously very important that we, that we work with creators who have lots of ideas. And I always get asked the questions like, what if I sign with you to write romance? And then all of a sudden I start, want to start writing X, Y, Z category. I think it's very fine to kind of pivot and, and switch categories. And I assume as creative individuals that writers aren't going to be in a box their entire career and that's totally fine. But um, you know, it's just about open li lines of communication, a lot of trust involved in, in these relationships. Um, there, there's so much that goes into uh, a really strong uh, agent client relationship. So I mean, like, again, I'm like, I'm, I'm like, well, Marilyn Robinson didn't publish for 30 years <laughs> or whatever it was. And then she published, you know, I think it was Gilead. She kept her comeback novel. And it's like writers have different creative cycles. I think there are writers who churn a book out every year. I, uh, I remember I got to talk to David Baldacci once and he's like writing two books a year, <laughs> just like just psycho levels of like productivity. And I think maybe literary fiction writers in particular might have slower gestation periods or longer gestation periods. Is there a bare minimum that you're looking for and that agents in general are looking for? Like what's a healthy output? Is it a book every two years? That feels aggressive to me. A book every five, three, like what's the, what are you looking for? Yeah, I think it's such a good question. And I, when I start to have those conversations, I always try to take a few steps back and think about like, how do we define success for you? And what does success look like for you? And how can we kind of 
build a world and a life and a creative life that really satisfies what you're trying to do and get you paid for it. <laughs> because if you, you know, obviously we can get into the economics of, of writing books, because if you are writing a book every so many years, advances obviously, are, as most writers know, are divided out into parts. Traditionally, it's you get a third of your advance on signing the agreement, a third of it on delivering the final draft of the manuscript when it goes into copy edits, and then a third when the book makes its way out into the world on, on publication day. And so when you think about how many years it's going to take you to write your books, you know, if you're in a multi-book deal, if you're in a one-book deal, right? Like the economics also of writing start to come into play for authors once they're once they're making their way into the publishing world. So that also, you know, has people thinking about what makes the most sense for them and how that money is kind of divided out for them. That's something to think about. Um, I have clients who write a book a year. I have clients, especially in the nonfiction space, you know, when they're an, they're an expert in their category and or they're an academic and they're writing that one book and they're going to tour that book for a while or promote that book for a while. They might only be writing a book every every five years. I tend to work on fiction a bit more and kind of in the commercial up market space. So we're definitely looking at clients that are writing books every year, every two years, every three years. What is what is the commercial up market space? <laughs> I am so glad you asked, Brad. Okay, because good. Because <laughs> I have a whole, you know, Instagram series about explaining all of this. I'm always happy to explain it. So, commercial fiction is your plot-driven fiction, right? This is your thrillers, your mysteries, your romance novels. That that's your commercial fiction, very plot-driven, that sort of thing. Upmarket fiction, and I actually have an article coming out um, on Jane Freeman's website about upmarket fiction because it's this kind of middle ground between the commercial and the upmarket fiction. Or sorry, saying that again. Upmarket fiction is that midpoint between commercial fiction and literary fiction. If literary fiction is your, I call it capital L literary fiction, meaning potentially more craft driven, possibly awards potential, um, you know, we're languishing a lot more on the words and their meaning and, and all of that sort of thing, that's going to be a lot more um, literary. And so upmarket fiction is the space in the middle. And I call it character driven fiction, because you kind of want that plottiness and that pace of commercial fiction, but you're going to kind of marry that with elements of literary fiction. And so there could be elements, again, of craft where it might be very beautifully written, but we're going to be focusing on pace as well. So um, I I kind of uh, imagine it a bit on a spectrum because obviously there's a lot of blurred lines here, um, but those are kind of the three buckets that I put fiction in. I would posit that a recent guest of mine, uh, Rebecca Mackay, is a great example of upmarket fiction. Her new her new novel, I have some questions for you. Seems to, I, I, right? Sorry. Do you I have, have it? it right here? Okay, I was just grabbing it. Yes, um, absolutely. It's so interesting because obviously she was nominated for the Pulitzer for Great Believers, and so people would think Pulitzer are very literary, right? And I think that she has an extremely literary quality to her, but she understands how to entertain people, right. <laughs> and that is a very important component of upmarket fiction. Yeah. And you know what? It should be an up, it should be a very important component of just about any fiction. There's a lot of different ways to entertain people and not totally. everybody loves to be entertained in exactly the same way. So I'm not suggesting that everything has to be like a rip roaring plotty novel. But if you're writing a book, you are trying to communicate with somebody, right? If you're putting a book out into the world, it's, it's nice to think about their experience <laughs> as opposed to just like indulging your, your own need for self-expression. You know what I'm saying? I, oh, I say, absolutely. I say yeah. this to myself as much as I say it to anybody else. <laughs> and the other thing is like you are asking somebody to pay money for this experience. And yeah. so if you were asking somebody to pay money for this experience, then there is a certain level of entertainment that is involved. I do feel like I'm in the entertainment business. I do feel like I'm obviously adjacent to Hollywood, but I do feel like I'm in the entertainment business because we are competing. Books are competing with Netflix and you know TikTok and all the other ways that people use their leisure time we're competing with that and therefore we have to think of ourselves as entertainment oh yeah that I mean maybe this is later in the talk but we might as well bring it up now because it's an interesting question to ask about agents evaluating prospective clients and their work and thinking about its IP potential you know as an intellectual piece of intellectual property and how it might translate the world that we live in there's so much crossover and content is you know being a content creator and being able to write like a book like Rebecca Mackay can do that you can easily see being turned into like a really sexy, like limited series on HBO or whatever, like that sort of stuff must get agents excited, right? Like how much of that is part of your evaluation process? Yeah, yeah I think that's so interesting because 
we were really in, I want to say at the beginning of the pandemic, especially, and before the pandemic as well, um, with stream, you know, all the streamers kind of coming on board, you know, so many different opportunities and places to sell IP. And that was a golden age of a lot of people getting a lot of options for their books. And options don't mean of something is going to be on HBO Max. It just means that you're going to get some money and potentially somebody might make something of it down the line um, in some sort of consumable way. Um, yeah, there was, there's a, there was a lot of opportunities um, for authors to make money. And in the pandemic, also all of these people at the beginning of the pandemic were shut down. So I knew lots of TV and film agents calling me saying like, so-and-so actress is like, you know, she's in lockdown at home. She wants stuff to read. Like, how do we get her stuff? Right. And so there was a huge demand for content, um, especially with all these streamers competing with each other. So does it get me excited? Absolutely. Mostly just because it's an opportunity to sell more books and get my authors more, a higher advance and more money for their future books, right? It's about creating this digital legacy and, um, you know, this, this creative legacy for, for my clients in this multimedia way. Some of them want to adapt their own work, right? And, and this gives them an in to kind of build those skills and, and work on those kind of writerly muscles. So it is very exciting. It's never, I never think about that at the expense of what is a great book, because at the end of the day, I'm a literary agent. I'm not a talent agent. So to me, the most important thing is the book, but are are there opportunities to make money out there? Yeah. Okay. So on a kind of related note, let's talk about digital literacy, which is increasingly, or it seems increasingly important. Authors who like are good at the internet, authors yes. who are, you gotta, you know, they have a big plat, quote unquote platform. They have the social media following. They're constantly documenting themselves on social and performing their lives in public. I'm saying this with some disdain. <laughs> I'm also saying this with some self-loathing because I mean, I'm not like, a, you know, it's not like I'm removed from any of this. It's a, it's a tension that I try to navigate. I think a lot of writers struggle with it. A lot of people maybe struggle with it, but it's, it's part of the world that we live in, right? It's a kind of a reality that you have to come to terms with. Yes, I gave a keynote talk at Surrey International Writers Conference this past summer and it was all about encouraging writers to think about themselves in this way as content creators of some capacity, even if you're writing a book, right? Like you're creating content for somebody to consume. And the way that we think about storytelling, obviously as authors, you're thinking about it in a page capacity. How are we going to, you know, entertain somebody on the page, but there's so many other ways to tell stories. And so when I think about, you know, I'm pretty active on Instagram and have been on Twitter for many years. Um, you know, there's a reason Instagram stories are called Instagram stories, right? Like it is about storytelling and creating, you know, creating these relationships with other people in the world, you know, breaking down these barriers, breaking the fourth wall, you know, creating these relationships. And so um, understanding how you want to lean into that as a creator is really all, all that I ask of my clients. Some of my clients have podcasts and I think, you know, it's a wonderful medium. And then one of the reasons that I have a podcast, um, you know, the shit no one tells you about writing because it, it gives us this long form way to communicate these thoughts. And in social media, I think especially writers are like, how am I going to sum up these complex thoughts in a tweet? You know, and you can't a lot of the times, right? And so I think it's just about leading into whatever works for you and whatever capacity that is. You know, it used to be obviously blogging was a big thing, you know, Twitter, other social media platforms, but really just understanding how the internet works and how the creator economy works, whether you want to enter into it is obviously up to all of my authors. I don't think novelists have to be on the internet if they don't want to be. You know, I, I talked earlier about my client, Blendy Vandera. I read her pitch. She was absent on the internet when I signed her as a client, like zero followers anywhere. Um, she ended up really liking Instagram and, and she spends time there, Glendy Vandera, but really it wasn't, it wasn't something that anybody has to do. It's kind, um, it's kind know, of a flex. It's, I feel like it's kind of a yeah. flex to not be on the internet. Like Otessa Moshfag is like, no, it's beneath me. And like, I'm like, yes, that's kind of cool. Like, I'm not going to tap dance for everybody. No, no. Or it's like, it's like tacky, you know, or something, but it's also a sign of great privilege. I think when you don't have to be out there like tap dancing, I mean, totally. then you're in the catbird seat. Totally. Yes. It's a, it's a really strange world. One of my clients, I represent um, a self-published client and I sell her TV film translation and audio rights and she self-publishes and she is what, what kind of work, active. what kind of work does she self-publish? Thrillers. She writes thrillers. Her name is, name's Kirsten Moglin. She writes a book every other month. She is, she is constantly publishing. Are you also she her is... cocaine dealer or like, <laughs> no. no, she is prolific. When you say the word prolific, like somebody's prolific, like she is prolific. She just treats it like a job. You know, it's nine to five button chair writing books. She doesn't really tour them or promote them like, cause she's constantly writing. So yeah. 
damn <laughs> that's unbelievable these people like that's like that's like uh there's a word for it and i'm totally gonna like forget what it is but people who have to like like they can they have to write like lots of words every day stephen king has this he does like ten thousand words a day um, yeah, it, it's a it is it's quite an experience working with her um because we're just we're working at a pace that traditional publishing is not familiar with <laughs> right but then she goes out does she uh, does she sell print books or is it just ebooks she does yeah so she everything's available um she is stocked in barnes and noble as well um we've sold her tv rights to her um her book the arrangement um so yeah no things uh things are happening for her and she is just really successful in her lane and i have so much respect for everybody just knowing how to work their lane uh, yeah but i mean i think people listening might go wait a minute a self-published author with an agent like how does that happen that's not typical no so she, when she signed with me she had already sold over three hundred thousand copies and in a year and a half since working with her we're now over a million units of her book so, you know, she was at a velocity and capacity where she really needed help with all of this work that she was doing, right? So she needed help with managing the business side, managing the audio rights, managing the TV film and translation, which is what I help with. How, do, how does somebody do that? Like, how do you, I mean, obviously the books have to be decent, but like, like that's crazy. 300,000 copies of a book. I know there are people out there listening to this who have been in the trenches writing literary fiction for ages who are going, oh my God. That's like I exponentially know. more copies than most people sell. It's it's unfathomable. You have to remember how large, obviously, the English-speaking world is. Obviously, the U.S. is huge, right? So there's a lot of people. Um, I, I sold a book that has sold 4 million copies before. So, I mean, like, there is the capacity for books to reach enormous amounts of people when we think about, you know, the the a potential to affect people's lives when you write a book and you set out to write it and, and how many people books can potentially reach it's kind of incredible that you can you can really um you know spend that much time with with people and with readers all right but what about people who this is something i bitch about on my show constantly or i just like not not, not just on my show in my life too <laughs> i do it everywhere but i think like it, it is for somebody who reads a lot of books and is in conversation with lots of writers who are so gifted and who are doing incredible work and whose books are reaching 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 people. It can get frustrating to me to think about that reality. And I think maybe some people will feel bad about themselves because they're like, wow, my book didn't sell 4 million copies. Like using book sales as the only metric to define a work of art's value feels a little unfair to me it's just like the math gets crazy because yeah there is a huge number of people in the english-speaking world and there is this capacity for a book to reach a ton of people but i feel like how that happens it's the way of, of author's control it's up yeah. to the stars like sometimes books get that ride like i feel like i have some questions for you just to return to that example mm -hmm. it's getting the ride that every literary fiction writer wishes for their book but there's really only a small handful of books each year in that category who mm -hmm. get that ride. And I don't think Rebecca or anybody on her team could fully define why it's happening. I mean, obviously it's an excellent book, but there are lots of excellent books and Absolutely. not all of, it doesn't happen. It's like some have the magic fairy dust and some don't. <laughs> there's so much out of everybody's control because if we all knew what we're going to be the blockbusters, we would all be working at bomb blockbusters in terms of like, Again, how do we define success if for commercial publishing, the idea is that we need to pay the overhead and keep the lights on in these Manhattan buildings, then yes, there is a certain amount of money that, you know, transactionally that, that needs to happen. But in terms of creative capital, right, what you're talking about is the value that we assign to something. It doesn't have to be financial. There's a lot of value in books that do go on to sell 2,000 copies. There's a lot of books that I have sold that I wish sold 4 million copies and haven't. And how do I know which is the books that are going to sell a million copies? I don't know that, right? Um, but but, there's but do you still, market. as an agent, I mean, I, I apologize for interrupting, but like as an no. agent, when you have a client whose work you believe in and that book goes out into the world and it only sells 4,000 copies, does that diminish your enthusiasm for that client if you really believe in the work? Never, never, ever. Because I know that they are capable of something great. And if I saw that in them, then they can, again, do it again and do it again and write more books. The thing that gets frustrating or sad to me is obviously when they take that feedback and stop writing, obviously. 
if they if they kind of don't continue with their career, that would be disappointing to me. The other thing that gets disappointing to me in terms of a publishing concept is when we think about what we call track record, right? Like how many copies of a book sells, therefore how much money can you get in the future for your books? Because publishers tend to kind of make offers on books um, in line with the number of copies that have sold of previous books. And so sometimes it's hard to move up the ladder in publishing to like make more money, you know, potentially get a better advance or a bigger advance. Um, unless the sales units are there to kind of support that. That's the part. Those are the two pieces that get frustrating for me. Yeah. And like for what, like really good writers whose books have gone out and have not done huge business. I've heard that like a lot of times, like acquiring editors will just look at book scan numbers and just be like, well, they're, they're not selling. So I don't care how good this book is. We're not taking something, you know, we're not taking the new one. Yeah. because we don't feel like it's going to be a money maker. Is it that cold and calculated? I don't want to bum everyone out. But sometimes it is like that. It could be that they love it. They don't love it enough to kind of combat the amount of work they have to do in-house to combat those sales figures on BookScan. The other thing about BookScan is that BookScan isn't the whole piece of the puzzle. So BookScan actually only reports about 60 to 80 percent of all book sales. So that's the other thing that's frustrating. It's like you could know that you sold a lot more than shows up on BookScan, but BookScan doesn't report everything. Okay. So there's digital literacy. Well, we talked about creative longevity being a consistent producer. We talked about digital literacy and having at least some facility for that can be a feather in your cap. Um, a third thing is market awareness is being somebody. And I think this is something that so a lot of times writers, you know, they see themselves as artists and I get that because that's who they primarily are. But the reality is that you have to wear a lot of different hats uh, when you're doing this. And I've noticed in my experience talking to people that there are certain writers who are really tuned into the business of publishing in a way that sort of shocked me. I was like, wow, like they're reading the trades. They're in there. They like know who's, they're very competitive. They know who's getting nominated for which awards. And I think some of that can be maybe detrimental, but some of it's good. Some of it's good to know. I mean, if you're going to be in this business, it's good to know what's going on on the business side. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think that level of market awareness, again, you can dial that up, you can dial it down. If it is anxiety inducing or it gets in the way of the writing, we need to right. dial it down. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's obviously useful to different people at different points in their life. Um, it's something that I like to draw attention to because there's a number of factors that kind of go into market awareness. You know, one of the things that I think about is like covers, you know, like if you are publishing in a certain category, do you know what a good cover looks like in your category? Can you pick out kind of in a lineup, you know, like what type of book that you would fit in with? Um, those types of things can be can be really important. I mean, I will say as a caveat in terms of market, I think all writers should avoid Goodreads. No writer has any business being on Goodreads. That is for the readers, not the writers. So please don't use Goodreads um, for your market for your market evaluations because um, authors can sometimes read feedback that it feels very hurtful to them. So avoid Goodreads. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. I got to say, like, I will like look at those. I'm like, oh, what's going on over here? Is anybody saying anything? No. Yeah. You want to get your agent or your editor to summarize all the good ones and then send them to you. That's what you want to do. You do not want to go on Goodreads. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So in terms of market awareness too, like, Publisher's marketplace, if you can swing the $25 a month, kind of keeping track of what's selling. Again, I feel, it feels so tricky because it's kind of a fluid situation and books are so specific, but I guess it could probably deliver some kind of useful awareness of how the market is behaving, right? Wrong. Yeah, there's also like, you know, like following the indie bound or like the indie indie next picks, things like that. Like what are the indie bookstores into library? You know, go to the library. I think something that's really interesting is every year, generally libraries summarize like what was our most popular books this year? Like what were the most requests? I think it's always interesting to see um, in different markets, you know, which books have the most highest request rate. That's always an interesting. Where, where you know, do you find that info? Like, you know, I know Toronto Public Library every year they will release, um, you know, the the most requested books that year. So oh. I think you can just go on every library's website. Oh, okay. So it's it's, that it's not like yeah. all the libraries compile. It's no, like specific... but somebody should make a blog or a podcast summarizing all of that data for us. That would be great. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of different ways to think about, you know, again, assigning value to something, success, meaning 
market what what is something that is marketable looks like or feels like but you know i think just being generally aware of things um is really important when you're starting your career to kind of know where you fit well i like that i like the the library thing because that's totally like reader generated Absolutely. and I, I feel like it can seem as though the only thing ultimately that sells books is word of mouth. Like you can put up a billboard, you can advertise in the New York Times book review, you can do this, that, and the other, but ultimately it's about readers reading the book, loving it so much that they press it into the hands of their friends or text about it or whatever it is. That's what really moves things. So like if you're looking at what people are asking for at the library, I guess book sales numbers are the same thing in some respect, but that seems like a useful thing to be aware of. Like what's moving people and then to try to maybe decode why that's the hard part. <laughs> yes. Well, I think it just, again, comes back to that chain of excitement or chain of enthusiasm we talked about, right? It's like all of that enthusiasm can eventually trickle down. I mean, and the reason that libraries find out about things is there is there's library journal and like all these trades, you know, that we talked about where they get information. So that enthusiasm, um, it, it, it does always trickle down and, and authors are, or sorry, the the readers, sorry, are the ones that continue that chain of enthusiasm into the community and, and into the book clubs and, you know, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And so we've talked about creative longevity, digital literacy, having some kind of market awareness. And then there's also the personal, I think, aspect of working with an agent where you are kind of creative collaborators in some sense. Agents are often the first reader of a project giving editorial feedback. I think this is increasingly the case where like the agent is serving in an editorial capacity and helping to, or, or helping to shape like future projects and bounce, you know, mm -hmm. bounce ideas off of them and they help you sort of formulate a, a game plan in that sense. And so the point that I'm getting at is that it's intimate. It's intimate Absolutely. to work with somebody like this. And so from an agent perspective, you want clients who understand this and who are a pleasure to work with, who understand that the relationship is cooperative and not adversarial, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I think, you know, there's, there's obviously different levels of intimacy of all my relationships with my clients like because some work that i work on with them i feel like we are working on very personal topics for example like memoir versus something else or um fiction that comes from a deep place of trauma for some from somebody's experience right and they're my clients trust me to unpack all of these things with them and and kind of help them through this and figuring out ways to communicate it and again figure out how, if you know is this a book so they're there's a really, really deep level of um, understanding and, and trust. And especially when I, you know, I have some of my clients I've worked with for 10 years, you know, it's like, I know their kids' names and I've met their parents and, you know, there, there's so many, um, so many different levels of those, of those experiences. I think, you know, whether it, it is a, you know, deeply intimate relationship or whether it is very strictly business, again, depends on the client, but trust is so important because no matter what, we're going to be shaping manuscripts or proposals together you know, working on ideas together. And we don't always have to agree. That's definitely never my goal is for us always to agree. Actually, I would like it if we, if there was many times that we didn't agree, right? Because we're going to have opposing viewpoints. And, and I think that's a good thing, but we have to be able to kind of communicate our way through that and, and trust each other to know that really my job is to have your best interests at heart as the author, um, not only in the work they're putting out in the world, but also in the business sense that, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to fight for them. What about a time when you like drop a client? Or a client drops you. That sometimes happens, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I think there's so many different reasons. Um, you know, I think there is... I've definitely had the the grass is greener thing where it's like, you know, maybe things aren't going the way they wanted and it's easy for them to kind of make an agent switch to be like, you know, maybe the grass is green over there and and that and that's totally, totally fine. Um, or there's, you know, times where I've maybe worked with somebody for a number of years and you know, I'm not getting them the level of success that I think they probably want. And, and I'm maybe I'm not the right agent for them. Right. And, and there's so many ways and reasons that we can, we can part ways. So absolutely. I think, you know, this is a very small industry. <laughs> this is a very small business. And so, you know, there, it's always obviously best, even when you're parting ways with somebody to be congenial and obviously respectful. The other thing about being in the agent business is that, you know, if I sell a book for you, I'm the agent on record for that book for as long as that book exists. So even if you kind of go elsewhere and, you know, and, and again, 
many different reasons why that might happen is that we're still going to have a working relationship because of, you know, translation deals or audio or film and TV or whether we're negotiating those royalties at some point. Do you know what I mean? So um, really, there it's it, there's never really a clean break. Um, you know, once we start working together, you know, our lives are, are intertwined once I sell a book for you. So what about talent? This is an interesting question to me <laughs> because I've heard it argued like people are like, you know what? Writing is less about talent and more about just being willing to endure the struggle and the pain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people who really want to be good writers can sort of work their way toward that goal as long as they have like a modicum of talent. And then I think about like a Rebecca Mackay, just to keep hammering this book. She's, she's basically getting a long form commercial for her novel. <laughs> on this. But it is like, <laughs> it feels like the novel of the season or one of the novels of the season. Uh, maybe she's just a big talent. Some people make what I call big noise. And some people who are super gifted and have written beautiful books, they make smaller noise, but it's no less beautiful. Like I'm tr it's always about me trying to navigate this. Like I feel like so many books should be multi-million sellers mm -hmm. and they're just not. And it drives me crazy that more people aren't discovering this work, but there's only so many hours in the day. How do you think about talent from an agent's perspective? Mm -hmm. To me, it's number one because there's nothing more important to me than talent because it's, I don't feel like it's my job as an agent to teach somebody the craft. You know, it's like, that's the work that they need to do before we start working together. My background is entirely in agenting and rights sales. You know, I never worked on the editorial side of the desk. So I've always thought about books in terms of, you know, can I sell this book? Right. Um, so that's so important to me. And so the talent is it talent period, you know, that that's it for me. What I, think is talent is also unique to me because of my taste. So I'm going to have opinions about that. But really, I want to work on books that I want to tell other people about, you know, whenever when anybody asks me, like, how would you describe your list or, you know, your client list to somebody, I always say, I want to work on books that people want to talk about. That's it. That's my MO. You know, I want to work on books that, you know, make us cry or make us feel or make us think or, um, you know, improve the conversation, add to the conversation, move the conversation forward in whatever capacity that is. That's the most important thing to me. And, and you know, the storytelling is, is how that's going to happen. So it's not my job to teach somebody craft. Um, I can obviously polish books and figure out, you know, is, is, this, is this the right start for the book? Do we begin in the right way and, and help craft in that sense? But, you know, talent is it. That, that That's why I'm here. I feel like agents are some of the best and shrewdest readers out there because they read so much and they read so much that's contemporary and maybe because they read so much stuff that's not right. You almost learn a lot from the bad stuff, I would imagine. <laughs> but I've had that experience with my literary agent where I'm like, wow, you know, you're very like, and also agents tend to be really good writers, maybe not like writers of fiction, but like just communicators, communicators. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe it seems like a natural you know, a natural thing, considering how many words you're taking in on a daily basis. <laughs> a lot. The a answer lot. is a lot. Yeah. So I mean, even though you see yourself and your training and professional focus is on right sales and, you know, that sort of stuff, you do have a very well cultivated editorial sense, I would imagine, right? Just as a function of done, having done it so many times. Yeah, yeah. And I always say, you know, because I do edit to a certain capacity in my clients books, as I say, but I'm not a trained editor, but I say, I edit like an agent, like I edit to sell your book. That's my goal. It's going to go off and have an editor and a copy editor and a proofreader, but I am the first editor often of the project, right? And so I do have to have a certain level of those skills. It's like, yeah, you're editing for sale. That's, <laughs> that's but you know what, like, what a useful thing to do. I mean, right, that's the whole point. If you're trying to publish a book, you got to sell it. So you need somebody who knows how to do that. And if if somebody out there is a nonfiction writer, what are they, are there is there differences in terms of what you're looking for? A little bit. Um, you know, nonfiction is a lot about platform and being an expert in something, and so that's kind of one of the big pieces. You know, we talked earlier about social media and how I said, if you're an author, you know, it's not the end of the world. With nonfiction, social media is kind of a big piece of the puzzle. What If it's not social media, then it's speaking engagements or, you know, journalism or other things that can kind of contribute to you having a platform. That's kind of one of the most important things. Um, 
being able to kind of bring a new idea into the world. And if it's not a brand new idea, then it's a new perspective or a new version of that idea is also incredibly important. I often think with nonfiction, when I look at a proposal, I'm like, is this a book or is this a documentary, a podcast, an article? Like, why does this have to be a book? That's a big question we have to ask these days because there's so much information we get on the internet. So again, why does this need to be a book? That's a big thing with nonfiction that we really have to be you know, very specific about. Um, and is this the right person? Is this the right author to sh- um, kind of share this information? There's a lot of experts on a lot of topics out there, um, but they, again, have to be a great communicator of ideas, be able to kind of connect some dots in ways that haven't been thought of before. Um, and so I love working on nonfiction because I learn a lot as a human being. I work on, you know, I work with authors on all sorts of books. I worked on a geopolitical book about China called China Unbound. I work on cookbooks, you know, I worked on a health and wellness book called Good Food, Bad Diet. So I'm really open to a lot of ideas. It really just has to be a value add to someone's life and, and not be able to find it anywhere else other than a book. Is nonfiction easier to sell than fiction? Yeah, sometimes it is. Yeah, because, you know, it's like any product where it's like, is there a gap in the market, you know, or does an imprint, which is kind of a division of a publishing house, not have a book on that topic, they could be looking to kind of fill that spot in that category. And so there's kind of an easier way to slot that in. Um, And then the opposite of that, you know, why it's not is that... um, a lot of it has to do with platform. And so again, if there's somebody out there with a bigger platform than you, then a publisher might just be waiting for the person with the biggest platform because again, they want to sell the most amount of books. Yeah. It's easier to market too. I feel like it's easy. Like like if you have a nonfiction book, it's like, it could be anything, but let's say it's about like foreign policy or food. It's easy. I think to know where to go to market it to talk about it is something that's accessible to people who are on the receiving end. So like, let's say you do a podcast, you're talking about food. That's easy for the listener to grapple with. If you're trying Mm -hmm. to talk about a novel that 99% of the people listening have not read, (laughs) this is my life, right? Doing this show is that like, I'm trying to like navigate that tension between like wanting to discuss the work in depth, but also bring along a reader and make the show interesting to a general audience. And it's easier with nonfiction because you're, you're asking the biggest question that all marketing departments of publishing houses have to ask themselves is like, how do I get general fiction readers to care about this book when so many are put out into the world every year? Um, it, it's it's the biggest question of all. Yeah. And so to draw another distinction between fiction and non nonfiction tends to be sold on what's called a book proposal. So can we just, for people who might not have any awareness, we just give like a quick uh, definition of what that is and bring people along. Yeah. So for novelists, you're writing the whole book, right? I need to kind of see the whole thing with nonfiction. We sell it on proposal, which is good and bad. (laughs) Good because it helps you connect all the dots, figure out what your book is about. And usually it's comprised of what I, and this is the way that I do it, but it comprised of an overview. So kind of like what this book project is about, the saleability, why you're the right person to write the book. Then we move into author bio. Again, you, you, the expert, We'll talk about your kind of potential marketing plan, which includes, you know, the connections that you have, all of that sort of thing, all of your platform information. Then we have chapter summaries, and then we have about three sample chapters. And so the book, the book proposal can end up being between 60 and 100 pages sometimes, depending on all of that information and how it kind of goes in um, and how it all weaves in and fits together. Um, and then you, we just go off and pitch that proposal. And because it's kind of sold on an idea, um, there's a little bit of flexibility. You know, say one editor says, like, oh, I like this piece of it. You know, like, let's amp up this. And so there's a lot more shifting and creating, obviously, that comes into building out the whole book. Um, that's kind of an interesting thing about working on nonfiction, but again, it's exciting. You're like, I don't have to write this whole book, but you have to know exactly what your whole book is about. So you actually do have to do a lot of work. Yeah. And then it sells and then you're on the hook with a (laughs) deadline. It's like, oh shit, now I got to write it. (laughs) Yes. You usually have a year to write it, which is usually a lot of time you think, but if you have other things going on, a year comes up on you pretty fast. Yeah. A year. Yeah. So memoir is the exception. Memoir is a very tricky one because it straddles both lines. Obviously, memoir is nonfiction. It is it is classified as nonfiction. But it has a lot to do with fiction because it needs to ideally be completely written unless you're a celebrity. 
Um, and then you have to kind of make sure that your memoir has a beginning, middle, and end, right? And you're following a lot of those kind of craft things that you learn about that novelists um, that novelists have to follow as well. So it does straddle those lines. Often with memoir, I have my clients finish the whole thing and we write a proposal because we have to include a marketing plan um, and chapter summaries and and you know all of that other stuff. So memoirs sometimes have to do twice the work, unfortunately. I'm writing a memoir right now. <laughs> So thank you for, <laughs> You're welcome. thank you for just leveling me. But it's a, it's like a braided work of personal narrative and American history. Ooh, it feels yes. like, I mean, I don't know. It's about the last four months of the Trump regime. Mm -hmm. It feels like I, I, sometimes I'm writing and I'm like, I feel like I have to write this book. And there are writers out there who might have a similar experience. So hopefully my complaining here is useful. But I feel like sometimes I'm like, wow, this is a book that I deeply feel like I have to write. And it's the only kind of project that I really should undertake because I have to sustain the energy to do it. But I sometimes think that I'm like, I think this, is this going to be a book that like some university press in like Arkansas ends up publishing? <laughs> you know, like, I don't know about like the commercial viability. It's tricky to know. You know, sometimes like, you don't know till the end, right? Like with any book. So it's, sometimes you just got to like put the blinders on and, you know, focus on the writing while you write. Focus on the writing. That's what I'm trying to do. And then mm -hmm. once I finish it, after I've completed that arduous slog, I will then set about to write a proposal in addition. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how agents think about finding clients and signing new clients. Um, there's slush pile. There's direct email, internet outreach, there's conferences, and there's pitch contests just to or like, you know, I guess there are pitch contests where you can go out and take a crack at it, right? Do you, have you participated in the contest before? Yeah, there used to be a lot more on the internet. There was like pitch wars and things like that. There used to be a blog. Um, some associations like Women's Fiction Writers Association would have like a forum online where agents could log in and we would compete against each other for like being the first one to request the book. So there was like a level of contest about it. Yeah. There's a few, there's less now. There is still a kind of Twitter pitch contests, um, but I don't know the names of them all, but they're out there. I, I want to say, who was I? Oh yeah, I was just talking to my friend Gina who is publishing a book with my publisher and she essentially pitched the book on Twitter and ended, ended up getting a book deal. So there's a lot of different ways that this can happen. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's not the, that's not the uh, common way, but it does happen sometimes. Um, but just to review in terms of what you're looking for, you know, when you're trying to find and sign new clients, uh, just the big kind of key points for people to take yeah. away. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, there's so much as we've talked about, right, that I kind of have to sort through to figure out what I connect with. But really, the type of fiction that I work on, I want some sort of emotional investment, I have to feel I have to feel something. Um, I always say if I cry, then I sign it, like no questions asked. I'm like, if I am that moved by something, I have to offer representation. I have also heard I've had I had a film agent back in the day, who used to say funny is money. <laughs> Like if you're funny in the room, it was more, it was less about the work itself and more about being a pit, you know, in a pitch room. But if you make them laugh that they're going to, yeah. you know, but money I think it's money and you cry, you buy. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. There you go. There we go. Uh, yeah. And the other thing about my side of the job is there is some editing involved. Right. And so I want to make sure that the client and I have very clear vision for the book because they might get other offers of rep, right? Like I might not be the only agent that's interested and we might want to talk about what edits we want to make and the vision and, and all of that sort of stuff. So we kind of have to be quite aligned on that. Um, I also have to know who I'm going to pitch it to. Obviously part of my job is knowing a lot of editors, but I also have to know like, Oh, when I read this, I can't wait to call blank or I can't wait to email so-and-so, or I can't wait to have lunch with blank. Right. And cause I have to be able to know that they're the type of editor that I'm going to be pitching this to. I think that this is something that a lot of writers might not have a deep awareness of is the aspect of an agent's job that requires them really to develop relationships with editors, to really understand what's happening on the publishing side and to function in essence as a matchmaker between a manuscript or creative literary project and the right house and the right editor within that house. Good agents are really good at matchmaking, right? And have... They hustle on that end of things. They're, they're having lunches. They're having phone calls. They're meeting people. Like you have to do that. 
right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's a huge it's a huge part of it um, for so many reasons. I I think one of the big things, obviously, lost in the pandemic was obviously the the lunches and the traveling and the you know the fairs and you know and we and we lost that for a while. And then everybody switched to Zoom, which was great. Obviously, so much can be accomplished by Zoom. However. I don't think we all, I think there got to a point where everybody's like, it's just not enough, you know, like the, Zoom can only replace so much. And then, you know, moving forward, we just, yeah, we have to be together. We have to talk about our books and catch up with each other and, and be in person. Um, and obviously things can be, you know, done by phone and email. I mean, there's editors that I've been cultivating a relationship with since I started agenting that I still have never sold a book to, but I feel like someday we will, you know, and I still go for lunch with them and I still pitch them books and, and they still reject my clients books and they go on to sell to other people. And, and that's all great. Right. Like we are all in this literary ecosystem together. The other thing is that editors move around, you know, like, so there could be somebody that I sell to them at a certain publishing house and then they leave that publishing house and they go somewhere else. And, you know, and I then set some of the things to other places, you know, there's just, there is a bit of a musical chairs, element to it um and so not only do i have to kind of know where an editor is at any given time you know how do they move publishing houses what are they looking for at their new imprint it is obviously a way for us to kind of keep in constant communication but also sometimes my clients get left behind when an editor leaves and so i do have to know the people in marketing and the bosses right like who's making the decisions so you know there's a lot of people to know and spend time with and cultivate relationships um and it's just you know it's like any other relationship business where um, you know, being polite, saying thank you, you know, doing going above and beyond whenever we can, um, you know, sending people, you know, congratulations emails when they get promoted. Um, there's just so many ways that we keep in touch, not only just pitching books and selling books. This is where being Canadian is to your advantage. <laughs> I feel like Canadian people are just nicer. <laughs> It's been my experience anyway. I love Canadian people. And uh, well, you know, I think we, we have a reputation for that, which is which can be very, very useful. And also, um, when we are more forceful, I think uh, people know when we really mean it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You know you've done something wrong when somebody from Ottawa is, you is know, on you. That's yeah. right. <laughs> um, so let's talk about rejection and why like, so people listening out there who have been rejected or who are about to submit, why do you reject books? Yeah, there's there's so many reasons. The most annoying reason, which everybody's going to be like cursing their headphones at me, is like it's a feeling, you know. It's you know, it's so it's so personal. As an agent, I am, as I said, I'm one person. I can only represent so many people, and so I have to be quite discerning. Um, it, there are some broad strokes things, obviously, and you know, I can give you the list of things that I'm really looking for. And doing this for 13 years, I'm pretty much have my little checklist of of what stands out to me. You know, the info dumps, the telling instead of showing going, you know, that's a basic craft thing. At the beginning of a book, if somebody slips really fast into backstory, I always think like, oh, I don't think this book is starting in the right place. Like if we have to go into backstory so fast, that's always a, a bit of a red flag for me. A lack of tension or like a power play or something in those opening scenes. Um, I always, again, I think, why does this book need to need to begin here? I really have to know. Awkward character introductions. Authors sometimes love to just let me know who all the main characters are going to be or who all the periphery characters are going to be in the first five pages. And I'm like, I just want to get to know your main character. Please let me spend time with them. Don't flip flop around. Uh, I really want to get to know who our main character is. And again, want to be invested in their outcome and spending time with them. Um, something again a lot of people have different ways of describing this I call it kind of overwriting where it could be you know calling it you know flowery language purple prose like people have all these different words of of saying this but I think when literary authors try to be capital L literary for the sake of being capital L literary it can often show and and so I think really paying attention and having a really good you know team of beta readers or critique groups or whoever it is that sees it before I see it you know, just really striking through as much of that uh, flowery language as possible and really just focusing on the, the bits that have to be there. Uh, there's a lot of different ways of kind of accomplishing this in terms of knowing how to start your book in the right place. Um, because I know when it's in the wrong place, it's hard for me to always know what the right place is going to be. But for me, a book has to begin at the most interesting point in a character's life. And then if it's not, then I'm like, why are we beginning here? So anything other than that, I, I really have to be convinced of, of why a book has to has to start there. So again, if it's a prologue or info dumps or backstory, all of those things, they just they tell me this is not this is not where the book is supposed to be. And and it's not that I don't take on projects that need work. 
again, I just have to have a vision for it if, if it does require work. So that's, that's a big thing there. Um, you know, we talked a lot about talent before and, and really just having a very distinct voice. You know, I, when I feel like a writer definitely has a point of view and they have something they want to say about the world, you know, that voice is so important. If I don't feel like this voice is you know, particular in any way, that can be something that rejects it. Um, another thing is when you're writing multi POV, multi POV, there was a huge wave. I mean, I don't see as many anymore, but there was a big wave of books where it's like every book that I ever got pitched was multi POV. And the biggest reason that editors reject multi POV books is that all the voices aren't distinct. And so if you're going to be pitching a multi POV book, it's so, so important that every POV has to be there, that every voice in, in each of those POVs is so unique. That's so important. Um, and personally, one of my big big things that I always really pay attention to is dialogue. If I don't feel like these are real people or real characters speaking, it's it's such a fast rejection for me. I just feel like I I I pay attention to dialogue um and and if it's not something where again I feel like these are real people or sometimes you know something that I reject in in dialogue is if the characters call each other by their name and characters so it's like <laughs> Hey, Brad, we're on the podcast. Yeah. And then Brad replies back to me. Hey, Carly, thanks for being here. And then it's like we do that all the time through the dialogue. Right. That's one of my big red flags. Or I, I um... always I always yeah, like when people don't use contractions in dialogue, people yeah. don't say cannot. They say can't in dialogue. And I think it's I mean, it's a, a, this is a craft discussion, but good dialogue. It doesn't like if, if writing good dialogue and making it seem like real people talking were as easy as just recording two people talking and then transcribing it, there would be no craft at all. But you basically just, you know, all you would need really is a tape recorder and you could exactly. transpose, but there's a music to it. And it's actually kind of a magic trick because good dialogue on a page is not actually how people talk. When people talk, it's a jumbled mess. <laughs> we cut each other off. Yeah. And there's interjections yeah. and nobody's yeah. that long winded. <laughs> but good dialogue on the page in a novel or, or a work of nonfiction tricks you into being like, this is totally real, but it's actually not. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to be immersed in the world. Like I want a reason not to put this book down. I want a reason to stay all night. You know, editors want a reason to miss their subway stop. You know, that that's why we work in this business is to be, be totally swept away. Okay. So just to uh, review, do writers need massive social media followings to get an agent and get published? You know, there's this thing going on. There's always some sort of tr Twitter drama, but the Twitter drama this week was somebody on TikTok said that novelists need big social media platforms. And then again, all the internet gets up and, you know, gets all worked up about this. So I replied back to that tweet and I will say it again here. So novelists, you do not require a social media platform to get published. It is absolutely not required of you, but nonfiction authors... If you're writing a nonfiction space, platform is quite important. Even so, a, even a weird memoir? Yes and no. See, this is why memoir straddles both of the worlds. So memoir, you again, that's a category where if it's a literary memoir, you get to be treated like a, a novelist. Okay. So you actually don't need a big, big platform if you're writing a literary memoir. Right. But if it's like about like Chinese foreign policy... You better know what you're talking about you when better... it comes to Chinese foreign policy. <laughs> and you also better have like some kind of presence, right? Like on the speaking circuit or on exactly. social media, something like yes. that. Or a professional credential of stature. Exactly. Uh, and then just you, you go through all these hoops. An agent wants to sign you. What's it like to work with a lit agent? What can people expect from that experience? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So one thing I like to remind everybody of is that I feel like there's this interesting power play between writers and agents, because at the beginning, authors think like, oh, these agents are on these pedestals and I have to work so hard and jump through my little hoops to get you. Um, but really, it's like you're the one that hires me. And so, you know, that power dynamic, you know, I think sometimes authors think it's like, oh, I have to write what my agent wants. It's like, no, we don't want you to do that. We want you to write what you want to write. We are your professional partner here, right? My job is to help you make a living from your writing that's my job. It's not your job to perform for me, right? It's like we work together. And so I think there's, as you start to kind of get an agent and work with an agent and make your way into the business, you realize that that power shift. And, and I wish that 
everybody treated authors, you know, to be on the highest pedestal because there wouldn't be books unless we had the creators to create them. You know, it's like, that's the genesis of everything. And so I feel like they are the ones that should be on the pedestal and, and we're all in service of them to, to again, to make, to help these books make their way into the world. So my job really is just to make writers' lives, e lives easier, right? That's it. My job is to help with all the business side of things, manage all of that, help you make some money from this, help coach you through making really good decisions, um, and really just push you creatively to be the best creator that you can be in, in whatever capacity that is. And again, help you make the right business decisions so that you can focus on the writing and the craft. But not like life choices, just business. <laughs> So, there's so many times where I've had to be like, this is a conversation for your therapist. This is a conversation for your accountant. This is a conversation for your lawyer. Sure. Like, yeah. My my limits are, are there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I'm going to have to charge you extra for that, you know. Uh, all right. So are there any closing thoughts that you have? And we've covered so much. This has been really great. I feel like we've really given a detailed overview of this part of being a writer. Are there uh, like, you know, any final thoughts you would have on this kind of partnership and what people should be thinking about as they venture forth? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think your podcast is wonderful because it, it speaks to so many writers at different stages. So, I mean, many of your listeners probably already do have agents um, and hopefully they have wonderful relationships with them. And if you are somebody who's just making your way into the business and, and kind of learning about what agents do for the first time, I think it's really just important to know that, you know, this, this is a partnership, right? And, and this, our goal is always to help you be the best you that you can be. And so having an agent that you can communicate with and that you can trust and, and collaborate with is really the ultimate goal. All right. Well, Carly, I've learned a lot. I, I think people listening have learned a lot. I really appreciate your time and energy and expertise. And I wish you well. I wish you and your entire stable of authors well. Thank you, Brad. Thanks for having me on. Um, I'm a huge fan of, uh, of the pod. So um, I'm just so glad you can make some time for me. 